the enzymes of our body use a combination of different mechanisms to carry out their catalytic function to speed up the rates of biological reactions. And the four major mechanisms of action that we spoke of previously include covalent catalysis, acid-base catalysis, metal ion catalysis, and catalysis by proximity and orientation. And so to demonstrate these mechanisms, we're going to begin our discussion on the first group of protein enzymes used inside our body, namely the proteases. So what exactly is a protease? Well, a protease is a protein enzyme. It's an enzyme molecule that is a protein that catalyzes the hydrolysis, the breaking of peptide bonds. And peptide bonds, also known as amide bonds, are the bonds that hold amino acids together in any protein molecule, in any polypeptide chain. Now, why would we need to actually break a peptide bond in the first place? Well, for instance, if we ingest some food particle that is a macromolecule, for instance, a protein, then we have to be able to break down that food protein molecule into its individual constituent amino acids. So that once we have those amino acids, we can either use the amino acids to actually form, let's say, ATP molecules, or we can also use the amino acids to actually form brand new proteins and brand new enzymes. Now, the second reason as to why we need to be able to break a peptide bond is because our cells actually need to be able to recycle protein molecules. For instance, if let's say a cell needs to decrease the number of protein channels found in the cell membrane, it has to be able to remove those protein channels and then digest those protein channels. And so inside the cells, we have these digestive enzymes in the same way that we have digestive enzymes inside our small intestine as well as inside our stomach stomach and these digestive enzymes are proteases. They are used to break down and recycle the proteins found inside our cells. And finally, as we'll discuss in much more detail in the future, these proteases are also actually used in proteolytic cleavage and that is used to activate or sometimes deactivate important biological pathways and biological molecules. So as we'll see in the future lecture, these different types of digestive enzymes are actually themselves activated by other proteases. So the digestive enzymes inside our stomach, for example, aren't always functioning, but as soon as we ingest food, those enzymes are activated by proteolytic cleavage by other protease molecules. So these are the three major reasons as to why we have to be able to break a peptide bond. Now, the next question is, why do we have to use a catalyst? Why do we need to use an enzyme for this reaction to actually take place inside our body? Well, as it turns out, as we'll see in just a moment, the rate at which the reaction takes place is very, very low. So let's take a look at this particular reaction. So we have the peptide bond between the carbon and nitrogen shown in purple. And what this describes is the hydrolysis of the peptide bond. So ultimately, the water molecule acts as a nucleophile, this carbon acts as an electrophile, and what happens is this nucleophilically attacks the carbon and ultimately displaces that amide bond, the peptide bond. And notice that the arrow pointing this way is longer than the arrow pointing in reverse. And what that means is equilibrium will lie towards the product side. And that implies that the products are lower in energy and more stable than the reactants. So we see that even though this reaction is thermodynamically favorable, it doesn't take place at a very high rate without the use of the protease enzyme. Now, why doesn't it take place at a very high rate? Well, as it turns out, water by itself is not a strong enough nucleophile to actually attack the carbon. 
and the carbon is not a strong enough electrophile and this has to do with the strength of this amide bond so as it turns out this bond here shown as a single bond is not actually a single bond this peptide bond contains a double bond nature double bond character as can be seen by drawing these two lewis dot structures so this is the first Lewis dot structure, but the other Lewis dot structure is described by this diagram. And so if these two electrons essentially go on to form a pi bond, so let's use blue. So we have these two electrons basically form this pi bond here. We get the following diagram. And so these two electrons in this pi bond between the carbon and oxygen basically go on onto the orbital around the oxygen and we form a negative charge on the oxygen, a positive charge on a nitrogen. But at the same time, we have a double bond between the carbon and that nitrogen. So we see that although this bond isn't exactly a double bond, it's also not exactly a single bond. It's somewhere in between because these two resonance stabilized structure describes the actual structure of that peptide bond, which is somewhere in between. So because we have a greater electron density that is fluctuating in between the carbon and nitrogen, we have more electrons fluctuating be between those two atoms, the electrons of the oxygen will not be able to get to that carbon because of electron-electron repulsion. And that's exactly what we mean by the carbon simply will not be a good enough electrophile and this oxygen on the water will not, uh, will not be a good enough nucleophile for this reaction to, uh, to take place at a high enough rate, even though these products are more stable and lower in energy than these reactants. So we see that although this reaction is thermodynamically favorable, it occurs at an extremely slow rate. And this has to do with the double bond character of peptide bonds. In this diagram, we see that the resonance stabilized structure of peptide bonds make the carbon this carbon here less susceptible to nucleophilic attack by water because of this resonance stabilization. The electrons fluctuate around the carbon and nitrogen as a result of the double bond character and that essentially electro uh, electrostatic repels the electrons of that water molecule and therefore in order for this reaction to actually take place at a high enough rate inside our body and in order for us to be able to quickly and effectively break down these peptide bonds we have to use these enzymes these proteases proteases as we'll see in the next several lectures actually make water a much better nucleophile and they make the carbon a much better electrophile they make these reactants much more reactive and that facilitates this hydrolysis reaction now we can actually categorize proteases into different categories and these are five categories of proteases. We have serine proteases, we have cysteine proteases, we have metalloproteases, and we have aspartate proteases. And we'll discuss these in much more detail in the next several lectures. And we also have threonine proteases. So let's very quickly discuss these four of the five protease molecules. So let's begin with serine proteases. And by the way, the major difference between these different proteases is the presence of a specific type of residue inside the active site of that enzyme. So in the case of serine proteases, from the name, you might guess that inside that active site, it's a serine molecule, a serine amino acid, that plays the nucleophilic role of nucleophilically attacking or breaking that peptide bond and so it's the serine that ultimately catalyzes that reaction. Now in addition to that serine as we'll see in the next lecture there are other additional residues present in the active site that also assist in the catalysis process as we'll discuss in the next lecture. 
Now, what are some examples of senior proteases and what are some of their roles? So let's begin with some digestive enzymes. So we have trypsin, we have chymotrypsin, we also have elastase. And these three are digestive enzymes found inside our small intestine, which basically play the role of breaking down the proteins that we ingest. We also have serum proteases in, in, involved in the blood coagulation process and we'll discuss these in much more detail when we'll discuss the blood cascade. And so these are, uh, these are thrombin and plasmin. Now, Inside our immune system, we have the complement system, and one important serum protease part of the complement system is known as the complement C1. And finally, serum proteases also play a role in reproduction. So when we discuss sperm cells, we said that on the tip of sperm cells are these structures we call acrosomes. And inside the acrosomes are digestive enzymes. And these digestive enzymes are known as acrosomal proteases. And these are examples of serine proteases. So serine proteases are involved in biological processes such as digestion, so trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, blood coagulation, thrombin, and plasmin. We have immunity, so the complement C1, and we also have reproduction, namely acrosomal protease, which are the enzymes which are needed to basically digest the whole inside the membrane covering of that X cell, so the sperm cell can move inside that X cell to form that zygote. Now, we also have not only serum proteases, we have cysteine proteases, aspartyl or aspartate proteases, and metalloproteases. So, as you might uh, as you might infer from the title, cysteine proteases basically contain a cysteine residue that plays that nucleophilic role of attacking that peptide bond and catalyzing this hydrolysis reaction. Now, cysteine proteases such as caspase and cathepsin are involved in programmed cell death, also known as apoptosis. And this is basically an immune response that our body has. And this process is also involved in a normal embryological development of that human embryo. Now, other evidence also suggests that we have cysteine proteases that are involved in bone remodeling as well as MHC class 2 processing. And remember, MHC class 2 is a protein complex found on certain cells, uh, immune cells of our body, where MHC stands for the major histocompatibility class 2 complex. Now, uh, these cysteine proteases are also found in many other organisms, and they're found predominantly in fruits. And so, papaya type of fruit contains a special cysteine protease known as papain. Now, let's move on to aspartyl or aspartate proteases as well as metalloproteases. So, once again, from the title, from that name, you can infer that instead of having serine or cysteine inside these active sites of these enzymes, we have aspartic acid. In fact, these enzymes contain two, so a pair of aspartic acids. And as we'll discuss in a future lecture, one of those residues takes away an H atom and the other residue basically is used as, uh, uh, is used to increase the nucleophilic character of that particular uh, substrate molecule. And uh, renin or renin is basically an example of an aspartyl protease that is involved in increasing or decreasing, so regulating the blood pressure inside our body. And we also have another example, namely pepsin. And pepsin is once again an example of a digestive enzyme. It's used to break down the proteins that we ingest into our body. And finally, we have metalloproteases, and these are simply enzymes, proteases, that actually utilize a metal atom, a metal ion, to basically catalyze that hydrolysis reaction. And two examples of such metalloproteases are carboxypeptidase A, which is an example of a digestive enzyme. We'll focus on it in much more detail in a future lecture. And we also have a bacterial enzyme known as 
thermolysin. So we don't have it inside our body, but certain bacterial cells have the thermolysin protease molecule that is used to break down peptide bonds inside that bacterial cell. 